Hello everyone, this is Mary Lou Lake, and this is podcast number two on my series on dissociative identity disorder. Um, I want to start by praying and asking our Father in Heaven that He would just guide me as I convey this information. I ask you, Father, that you would um, give me the ability, the grace to bring this information forward and that you would be able to use it to set people free. In Jesus' name. You know, in the last podcast, I was trying to think, was there anything that I I missed I should have put in there when I was discussing symptoms of DID? And I think one of the most important points I left out, and that was um, explaining how I thought my um, my thought processes were just normal. Because what I'd always done in my life is I would argue back and forth in my mind. I, I didn't hear another person's voice or an odd voice or I'd have been really concerned but my own thoughts were like um, if I had a decision to make I would banter back and forth and sometimes very differing opinions and that should have been a key for me you know that I I could have um, my mind divided the Word of God says in James 1 8 that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways and so you know just that scripture right there can tell you you can have Uh, double-mindedness and I definitely did but I honestly thought that was the normal way everyone thought until I had talked to my husband one day and explained that to him and I said don't you think that way and he says never so you know I started realizing okay uh, this isn't the normal way that a person thinks and so I wanted to talk about in this podcast some of those crucial things that God taught me during that eight months of bliss when I was just learning the word and and listening to Christian uh, TV and let you know how he was setting a stage for me uh, for what was coming that I had no idea about. Um, I remember almost everything I watched. It just seemed like it was orchestrated by God because I looked back and they were just all faith building uh, testimonies. I remember I was watching John Hagee one time and I actually recorded it because I was um, I would try to record things if I was a day when I had to do things and I couldn't watch them I'd try to to record them and catch them later and uh, he was actually talking about um, years before I think it happened in 1971 there was a Satanist that came into his church on a Wednesday night and had a gun and um, it, he was describing what happened and how this guy, I think he shot six times, you know, point blank at him and, and they didn't hit him. Um, and so it, it was those kind of things that were just faith builders. And little did I know that, you know, down the road, I was going to have to have that kind of faith. <laughs> I sure didn't know it at that time. Um, and so I, I really started reading the word for the first time in my life. And I, I started to recognize as I, I read through the Old Testament and that I, I had, um, in my mind divided Almighty God from Jesus and I I don't think I had a conscious awareness of it but I started thinking I've always thought Almighty God in the Old Testament you know he's very powerful would just take care of situations if people that did something wrong you know then there was there was a consequence and then I had somehow Jesus was in my mind as weak and all he did was show mercy So once I started seeing that I had that difference, um, God started uh, a process of me realizing that the God of the Old Testament is Jesus. And I don't know if other people ever have that thought process or not, but once I I came to that conclusion, it was almost like something, um, you know, was conjoined that needed to be conjoined in my in my spirit, in my in my soul, that I could I could grab a hold of, and understand more of the word from that perspective. And you know, there may be people that ha- that have that picture of a weak Jesus hanging on the cross. And if that's the case, then then you don't have all the truth you need. Um, if you're going to be in a, a spiritual battle, you have to understand how powerful Jesus was, and that He is Almighty God come in the flesh. You know, and if you if you picture Jesus and, and you're just thinking about he was hanging on a cross, uh, weak, you know, overpowered, then it's not the right perspective. And let me tell you why. Um, if you if you consider that that's that Jesus was Almighty God come in the flesh, 
you have the creator of the very um, elements that are holding him, the wood, the the nails. The, the very molecular structure is holding the creator. And it was like I could see all of a sudden that it wasn't the wood and the nails that were holding him because it was almost like I sensed a vibration that they could barely hold together, that the, the power of God was so strong that, that Jesus held them together. He held them. They didn't hold him. And so that was kind of a, a shift in my thinking <laughs> that, that helped. And I, um, I was thinking, you know, it, we just envisioned that this, this defeat was on Jesus. But he was, he was following um, the instruction of the Father as the Son. And, you know, he even said in, in Matthew, when they, when they came after him, uh, and, of course, one of the uh, what Peter had um, struck the the ear off of one of the people coming after Jesus and Jesus says to him thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels you know there, that's how many angels would have come to help Jesus all he had to have done is just said, said father send these angels and it wouldn't have happened he knew he had to follow the will of God and to show you the kind of power that was on Jesus and that when the same account is repeated in John 18 um, it says in verse 4 it says Jesus therefore knowing all things that should come upon him went forth and said unto them whom seek ye they answered him Jesus of Nazareth Jesus saith unto them I am he and Judas also which betrayed him stood with him as soon as he had said unto them I am he they went backward and fell to the ground which means the power was so great there they couldn't even stand and see that doesn't go along with a powerless Jesus beat up and hanging on a cross you know Flavius Josephus was a historian at the time and he said that that uh, Jesus looked like what could be uh, compared to just raw meat you know all of the sin everything that came upon him everything that he bore and you know this had to be one of the most excruciating painful deaths um, but the Bi Bible says that he saw the prize that was set before him and he endured the cross and you know I've said this before that that he looked ahead he saw every one of you he saw that little child that was in so much torment that it fractured their mind he said I'll take this pain and I'll die so you can be free so I can make a path to freedom for you and that's that's the powerful Jesus that we need to picture because he he could have stopped that he was willing to endure that had the strength to take that kind of pain and stay there so that it could be finished and he could make a way and that's that's the picture once once I got that image replaced in my mind of Jesus was weak and had been defeated to know he rose victorious over death hell and the grave that's when everything in my mind started turning around and I think it was one of the uh, points that I had to get to be able to understand everything that God was going to teach me so I'd be prepared for spiritual warfare that was coming um, I remember it was very significant when I started learning about the power of Jesus' name. And in Philippians 2, 9 uh, through 11, it says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And I, that once I started reading that, I'd go back there over and over and I'd meditate on that. But it was just resonating throughout my entire vessel how powerful the name of Jesus was. And I thought, you know what? This is, this is why demons recognize his name. You know, when you speak the name of Jesus, if there's a, de a demon... Oh my goodness there there is a point when they when they know that you know that authority that you believe with all your heart the power of the name of Jesus 
that's when you get the the reaction of oh my and and fear upon them i also had uh, to learn about the power of the blood of jesus and so god was teaching me different things i was hearing different speakers and i went online um yesterday just to see if i could find you know something that i could refer uh, people that are listening to this too that would be a, a good resource for them and I saw an article that Jack Hayford had written I read down through that and I thought oh my goodness this is exactly what somebody needs to read you know he even mentioned the things that I had believed I'd heard from God years ago that you know uh, somebody might say well this is like a magic formula you're using uh, you know pleading the blood of Jesus but he explains all that much more eloquently than I ever could and so um, this is at www.jackhafer.org backslash teaching backslash articles backslash pleading the blood. And I'll put that on the ad copy so you can refer to that and you can go there and, and read that article. And this um, is connected to a CD series that he did on pleading the blood. And I've never heard that, but I'm going to order it because it was it was so good. And I've always found his teaching so balanced, so good. And so I wanted to, to offer that for people so you can get that, you know, the, that uh, truth about the power of, of the blood of Jesus, the truth of the love of Jesus. Those are, are critical points that you, you have to build your faith on. And it, it takes, it's worth meditating over and over. That's why I wanted to give these truths first. Before we go into spiritual aspects and prayers to say, these are the uh, you know these are the things god taught me before i ever ever did the warfare because otherwise i wouldn't have had that foundation built and so it was um somewhere in i you know i didn't have notes on the exact dates that things happened so i've been trying to put it in the order i believe they they occurred but somewhere in the process um of all of that that time going through from um that was 1994 when I started out of the depression and then this period goes to um, you know the fall of 1995 and that's when the occult people came after so this was a learning process and hopefully I can get this in the order that it happened somewhere in that period this is when I heard God tell me to ask him to put the blood of Jesus over the doors in my life and I didn't, I, I immediately thought of, okay, this must have something to do with the blood over the doorposts where when uh, Moses was getting ready um, to lead the, the people out of Egypt and before that last plague where the, the firstborn were taken of the Egyptians, um, it, the first Passover, they put the, the blood of the sacrifice over the, the doorpost and then that death angel passed over. So I thought, okay, this has something to do you know with protection and and so i understood that but i didn't i didn't know that i had any doors because once i had come out of that depression i was really trying to clean house i was trying to um you know get rid of anything i had in the house that i thought that wouldn't be pleasing to god any movies i thought well that's probably not appropriate you know for somebody that's just really wanting to serve god and be a, a you know not bring reproach on on god i i had started um looking at even the movies that i let my kids watch and things like that so i was you know trying to clean myself internally trying to clean my, my house so i really didn't understand why i would have to put the blood of jesus over doors but i had no clue how many doors i had open but so god was so merciful he gave me a prayer i didn't even understand but i just was obedient and i and i said it and i think that that probably kept us safe many many times by god having us say that prayer and later, I, I'd read a book by Bill Sneblin called Blood on the Doorposts, and that was a confirmation to me because uh, Bill Sneblin had uh, formerly been in the occult, and that was a very informative book at that time for me. At some point, God also told me to put, uh, plead the blood of Jesus over my eyes and ears, and that, that's actually the, the main way that you're going to be accessed if you're a mind control victim. Um, your programming can be accessed through what they call triggers and this can be in person or even something you watch it can be hand signals words um, codes it can be um, this one I saw with my eyes I, I've witnessed this several times where a person opens their eyes extremely wide 
and I, I've saw I've seen that switch a person that they're with. Um, and so it's it's things like that that I started to see and started to, to pick up on. Okay, these are um, these are things that would normally you know cause programming to kick in, but by the blood being applied, it was like God was showing me how to have faith that there would be a screen there that the victory that is with the blood of Jesus, the power that's there, was going to stop you know programming being kicked in. And I'd also, um, now I'd never had this before until I started getting healed, um, but I started having tones in my ear. Um, and then then sometimes following that tone that I would hear, there'd be like a small electrical current in my brain that I, I could just have that sensation going like in a little line. Um, and I think that, that that was supposed to trigger a switch um, just to where you would switch to another personality. And so what I would do is I would um, plead the blood of Jesus to the point that that tone was originating from and to anything it opened up in my mind. Uh, those were things that I just learned along the way. I also think um, that there are signals that your brain can pick up um, through frequencies or you. I believe you can have an implant. You know, I was told that many uh, nurses in hospital nurseries are placed there by the occult. And if you've seen any of the information about technology now, about there's one uh, corporation, I think, that is having these little um, implants put in the hand of the of the employees to where it's like an ID chip or something. Well, they always say that whatever they present to the public, it's 30 years behind. So imagine they probably have had for years tiny, tiny little um, maybe radio receivers that could that they could have placed up babies' noses in, in the nurseries. I mean, there's all kinds of things like that that, that as we go along through the uh, podcast, we'll discuss more and, and, you know, the preventative prayers that we can say. Um, you may have heard or read about some of the stories where people are seeing these series of numbers, like they'll say they keep seeing 111, 222, 333, or 1111, and I, and I do plead the blood of Jesus and ask God to, um, if there's anything opened up by my discussion of this, that, that the blood of Jesus would be applied and that there would not be uh, anything or programming or anything accessed, but that Almighty God's power would prevent anything wrong or uh, bad from happening there. I, I think this is connected to mind control programming of the masses. There's too many people seeing it. I don't think this is just with mind control victims. Now, it, it was definitely connected to my mind control programming because after I started um, being healed, I'd wake up at, at times like one eleven. And then I'd wake up at 2.22. I'd wake up maybe the next night at 3.33. And, and when I would wake up, I'd look at the clock. And once I'd see that number, then I would start what I now know is called an internal earthquake. And it just felt like I was flying to pieces. I was shaking. Um, I felt like there, my chest was constricted. And I felt like um, that I was just, I had a horrible uh, dread, a fear there that was with it. Now, I had actually experienced this some many years before when my kids were still small, and I think my programming was really being broken up then. Um, I didn't see the numbers, but I was waking up having those internal earthquakes. So I'm, I assume by that that I was, my programming was being disrupted way back then. Um, back then what happened is I thought I was having a heart attack and so there were a couple of times this would happen in the night so I'd go to the emergency room and I remember the um, person that had you know they did an EKG and, and different things and they, they this was their exact terms you've got a heart as strong as a horse they said there's nothing wrong with your heart this has to be something else um, and so I just I really didn't even I think I had them I went to the normal doctor at one point and they did a um, like a, this halter that they um, put on you to check and see how your heart was beating in the night. And there were times like when I'd, I'd wake up and I'd have one of those shaking spells. And um, of course, you know, my heart was beating fast, but it was because it was, it was because that programming was having an internal earthquake. And it was, there wasn't anything wrong with my heart. I mean, I, I didn't know it at the time, but what I, what I decided was, uh, well, I'm living, this is in my heart, so I'm just going on. And then I was able to connect that once I, 
discovered about the internal earthquakes and all that, then I was able to put that together and understand what was going on. And what I can um, connect to that is that was when that shaking started, when I started having that, was the time that my uh, dad's parents were killed in a fire in their home. Um, they didn't make it out of a fire. And I, I've, I have looked back on that and thought, oh, I hope that wasn't uh, some punishment or something because my programming was um, being interrupted. But it was an odd connection, I thought. Anyway, as I, as I learned about pleading the blood of Jesus, it was, it was overriding the power of the enemy. I was, you know, that was how I was starting to see that, that there was hope for me to, to come out of, of everything that was there. And God had also uh, spoken to me about bringing situations before his court. And I'd never heard anything like that before, so I was weary about it, and I was proceeding with caution about saying those type of prayers. But, you know, now you can find many people that God's spoken to them a similar way about bringing situations before his court. And um, if you've never heard Dr. John Benefield um, talk about how God showed him about a divorce decree from Baal over our nation, that's very interesting, and, and I'd, I'd suggest that you uh, look that up. It's very easy to find if you just put in uh, John Benefiel, it's B-E-N-E-F-I-E-L, and put Divorce Decree from Baal, it'll come up and you can, you can click there. I think there's a, there's a YouTube video, I think there's some different ones that you can see what God showed him to do with that. Um, it was very important when I learned about my authority in Luke 10 19 which says behold I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you and that was that was vital for me to understand that um, you know victims have this evidence in the back of their mind that's blocked that will always um, fight against trusting God for protection and that's obvious because if you've been a child and you've had these horrible things happen to you and you've never seen these people stopped, you've never seen anything um, overpower them or anything stop them from accomplishing what they say they're, they're going to do, then there's going to be an internal um, protection to not trust anybody um, because you've never, you've never seen safety. And so it was really important for me to understand about the authority and to even understand the, the very basic of where when Adam was in the garden and God had given him dominion, then when he fell, he lost that authority. But when Jesus rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave, he took the authority back and he gave us his authority. And that's what Luke ten nineteen we can stand upon. And, and so I just started meditating on that verse. I knew that there were certain verses I could just sense in my spirit that there were things I had to have faith with. And so once I received the truth about the authority, then I, I was learning to walk. He was teaching me to walk in the safety of the kingdom of God and how to stop Satan's assaults. You know, I, I think victims will always have one or both of these beliefs internally based on the evidence of what they've lived through the blocked memories that are there and and the gatekeeper parts which um i'll go into that more in our next podcast but but it, um, i believe the gatekeepers can see everything that's happened to you and they see forward and their their function is to make sure that none of the blocked memories bleed over to the front that no one accesses them um so that you can continue to be functional and you won't have um, all of the horrible emotions flow through that are attached to that. But, the, but at the same time, a gatekeeper is analytical and, and they will be thinking, okay, the Word of God, I can see the Word of God says this, but then explain to me the evidence of what's happened in the back here. And so usually you'll have, you know, one or both of, of these beliefs that Satan must be more powerful than God based on this evidence or that God doesn't love the person because he didn't protect him. And so as I was going through the process of understanding I was a victim, there were a couple of questions that I heard, which I believe was, was a gatekeeper, asking these questions. And 
I pray that God will allow these truths to break the power of the lies of the enemy with anyone that's, that's listening that may have gone through this. And my first question internally was, if God loves me, why did he put other girls in safe homes and he put me in a Stephen King movie? And that was exactly how it was spoken. And I heard immediately the answer. And I heard the scripture where uh, the word says that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. And I heard the Holy Spirit say that it took those two sets of genes from your parents at the precise time of conception for me to meet the design that God had for me. And even though I was born under evil authority where the kingdom of God was not operating, that he started to plan right then to deliver me. And, you know, without understanding that man has been given authority and the only way to stop these evil things is for someone to pray someone to intervene someone that's walking in the kingdom of god to apply the principles well it's very hard for somebody to pray about something that no one can see is going on and it's one of the traps by it being hidden by it being concealed and cloaked is that is that the kingdom of god was hindered by that fact because of course God wanted to intervene and the second question I heard was why didn't he stop the people from hurting me and this is what I heard if I had stopped the hearts of everyone there where would they have put you and so I sat and I thought about that and I thought okay if this is my family or victims and and no one has any control over this if God would have stopped everyone's hearts I would have been standing there alone all the kids would have been there um where would they have put us they would have just put us in another sect somewhere another controlled family and this way um i was with my family that loved me with and and made the best home that they could in those crazy circumstances so there was such a release in me when i heard that i it was it made sense i was able to put it together and all of a sudden i thought okay and what went through my mind was this thought i'm not a little girl anymore i'm not under anybody else's authority i am beyond the reach of anyone to harm me because i will take authority i'll use the principles in god's word and i will be safe and it was a very crucial time with that information. And I pray that that helps anyone listening. Um, and then, then there was, uh, once I dis- decided, you know, once I understood that, that how this, this works, that you can have parts of, of your mind that are slaves that, that aren't able to stop, you know, being accessed and different things like that, uh, that you could have parts that, that they have trained in witchcraft and, and all these different things. Um, I just prayed by what I had learned with authority over the enemy. And I just started declaring, I belong to Jesus. He's greater in me than he that's in the world. Therefore, I take authority over my vessel, and I declare an override of any programming. I declare an override of any part of me that would be trained to be a witch or in the occult or do anything against my will for my body to be taken physically or on the astral plane in Jesus' name. I started just saying those prayers um, because I I believed it with all my heart that if if somebody had um, purposely created a slave in me, for whatever reason, my will connected to my heart, connected to my spirit that, that was renewed by the Holy Spirit, that I could trust God, that if I took my authority, that if he had to send angels that would stand and hold me down in the night or do whatever they needed to do to stop me, I, I believe that he'd do it. And uh, that was how I, I could go forward, um, trusting that I was just going to be, you know, if this had all, hadn't been interrupted, you know, he may have already stopped that. Um, but if if he hadn't, if that wasn't stopped through whatever circumstances, I wanted to pray that with my authority, and I believed it with my whole heart. And I don't believe that I, I ever did, because at the time, 
I was an insomniac. <laughs> you know, once uh, I had my youngest daughter, she kept me awake for four years. That poor baby, she just cried all the time, and I'd take her to the doctor, and they couldn't find anything wrong. I think, looking back, I think she had food allergies. Uh, but I was it was either leave her laying in the crib crying and hurting, or when I'd hold her, comfort her enough that she could, she could sleep. But um, I was always afraid I would, you know, drop her holding her or something because I was so sleepy at night. So I would... Um, I would just try to do the best I could to, to lay her down for just a few minutes and then I'd wake back up and it was it was just no sleep. And so through that process, I never slept good again until I came through my healing. And I came through enough that I was, was able to trust God that my sleep was safe. Cause I, I'd wake up, every, you know, it was hard for me to get to sleep, but then once I got to sleep, I'd wake up every hour, every two hours. That's just the way it was for years. and. Um, I, I told my husband this not too long ago that I think my parts were taking turns sleeping. You know, when your parts of your mind, if you don't get sleep, you're gonna, you're not gonna be able to function at all. You know, you're just gonna get sick actually if you don't get sleep. And so, I would, I would realize that I, I was thinking I'm laying there awake, but then I'd hear myself snoring. <laughs> so, what I came to the realization was is that my parts were taking turns and I would have a part of my mind alert to listen while another you know my body was sleeping and uh, it was kind of a kind of an odd thing to to recognize that but I think it's how I lived without so much sleep is is it just I rotated and I probably I probably started doing that as a survival mechanism those four years when I was getting virtually no sleep so for that reason, because I was awake so much, I don't, I don't believe that they were accessing me uh, for years. But anyway, I, I said those prayers and fully believed that, that God was would do what he needed to do as I took authority. And the next thing that was very, very important that I learned was binding and loosing. In Matthew 16:19 it says and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven whatsoever shalt thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven um, I know there's lots and lots of different ways of looking at that verse and a lot of people don't believe it means that you can bind the enemy um, I recently got an email from somebody that was trying to correct me and say that you couldn't bind there was no such thing as a generational curse and so there's lots of people that that don't understand this but um, if you want to hear a uh, more specific um, teaching on binding and loosing, my husband and I did a podcast where we addressed that. It's uh, KIB 63. You can go on our website and, um, and punch in the KIB 63. And when you listen to that, that that's a, a good one to listen to if you've not heard a teaching on binding and loosing. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about was uh, something that was a, I cannot remember the exact timing of when this happened, but it was before I knew that there was witchcraft in my family. I'd heard someone in all the teachings that I'd listened to, I heard someone teach on the Jezebel spirit. I can't remember who that was or I'd give them credit, but it was a very good teaching. Uh, and, it, you know, they described how Queen Jezebel is the wife of King Ahab. And they, you know, I went through all the scriptures where she was an evil queen that worshipped Baal. Um, it read the story about the uh, story of Naboth where her husband, King Ahab, wanted the vineyard that he had and Naboth wasn't going to to let him have it because it was his inheritance. And so what Jezebel did was she um, she brought people in. She had them lift him up before the people and then um, they, she had him destroyed, and swear Ahab could get that get that land. And so when you when you hear about a Jezebel spirit, it refers back to the type of spirit that was in control of her through that Baal worship, and it's it always is connected to witchcraft, control, rebellion against godly authority, manipulation, and seduction. Most people, when they hear about Jezebel, they immediately go to. Um, you know somebody that they'll say has all seductive makeup on and and uses seduction and there There's an aspect of that spirit absolutely But what I've seen more than anything else what I experienced in my own life was the control a Controlling spirit to where you know and if you've had something happen to you when you're a child and you didn't feel safe That spirit tries to take a hold um, I may have even been born with one 
to where where it's in the family line and they just try to control everything and I can look back and and see that in my family and uh, so anyway I'd heard this teaching <laughs> and I went and talked to, to someone that I knew very well and I, I told him I said I just heard this teaching about Jezebel and I said I think we may have that spirit I said neither one of us submit to our husbands because I I mean at that point you know I, I had not got my mind to the place where I I could just trust to submit to my husband to to submit to godly authority I just didn't I didn't trust anybody I don't think I even had the full understanding of why I didn't trust but I didn't and I felt like that I saw with as in this teaching I thought oh that sounds like me because I'd try to control every situation if I felt like that that we were put in a vulnerable state or something I'd try to control it so that I could feel safe and so anyway I, I went to this person and I said you know I think we ought to we ought to command that thing to go because you know we don't want to have this here we are Christians and and that person just went along with what I said and so anyway I did my prayer and I commanded to Jezebel's spirit to leave and didn't feel anything but just went on and that night when I got home I woke up in the middle of the night and I had this panic that a female was was missing so I got up and I ran and I checked on my two daughters they were safe in their bed nothing nothing wrong but I just had this horrible um, dread and fear and just it was a horrible feeling so anyway I went back I, I prayed and I went back to bed well I happened to talk to the person that you know I had went to and prayed about the Jezebel spirit the the next day and I told her what happened and she said well you're not going to believe this but the same thing happened to me and she was in the house at that time by herself on that particular night nobody else there but she said she did the same thing and at the time I thought well how odd and you know what looking back I think it was is I think we did have a Jezebel spirit I believe it left um, it had to you know follow the command and, and leave when I said that um, it it was not a good move on my part. I mean, I should have prayed that through. I should have talked to my husband. I should, because um, you know, I was I was just full speed ahead into a time of healing, deliverance, but the other person wasn't, and so that was not a good move on my part. Um, but it, looking back, I thought, oh, that's exactly what happened because because we felt. I think what happened is is uh, those spirits become intermeshed with with your mind and so you actually feel like that's not a spirit that's you so in our minds I think we were sensing there's a female missing well there was a female spirit missing but <laughs> we needed them gone trust me and so with each with each thing that I was learning with each step that I took God was showing me things that I needed to know that were essential um, what what I did after that is okay I said I had a Jezebel spirit so now I have to work to retrain myself to submit to godly authority so I really uh, tried um, to submit to my husband at that point and and try not to let fear overtake me and to stop trying to control situations just trust that God was in control of him and that that God would keep me safe and that's how I, I did that I had another situation where um, we were attending a church at that time and our, the kids in the youth group had kind of got into it and so the women wanted to get together and see if we could talk it out and the pastor because he knew from all the different people talking to him that he couldn't share reveal those <laughs> those confidential um, conversations he knew that this this could really turn out to be a bad thing so he was trying to dissuade that well we all went ahead and did it and it was by the grace of God <laughs> that there wasn't fur flying I can tell you because there were so many things being said but anyway after that I was praying and God told me he said uh, he said Mary you need to call that pastor and ask him to forgive you for not submitting to his his godly advice and so I did it. I thought, oh, this is hard. But <laughs> I called him up and I said, Pastor, this is what God's telling me. And I asked you to forgive me. Um, and he said, I already have. And that was, that was a huge step for me because it was so hard to do. Um, but I was just trying to do every, you know, it was like God was giving me the counter to everything that I was doing wrong. 
he was showing me counter it with this counter it with this and what he was doing is step by step breaking the power of those spirits in my life because you know you can command them to go but if you maintain a mindset that allows a stronghold for them they'll come back and they'll come back worse and so it was step by step god was showing me how to close the doors how to how to tear these things down and uh, you know i've heard a lot of people talk in the last few years and i i'd never heard this before i'd missed it in anything i had researched is that if especially if you have like come from an illuminati family that there can be a throne established to the antichrist built within the system and uh, I, I've looked back and I thought, ah, that's probably why God, not that I think I am was an important Illuminati family. I, I think we were low level, whatever this was. Uh, but I do think that that same spiritual, um, that same spirit of Antichrist would estab- establish a stronghold within any victim. And so I started looking back to see uh, what God had done to counter that. Um, because a, a spirit of antichrist is going to be opposite of the mind of Christ. And I had, you know, I think what God did is he He was having me focus on others. Uh, without me understanding what he was even doing. But, you know, the original prayer I, I prayed that started um, my healing was, was I got my mind off me and and i was thinking oh for my family's sake god please do something for my family's sake and and i think it threw such a punch into to against the antichrist spirit that it enabled that period that grace period i had um to learn the word and to get some strength um and even one time when i was um coming through my healing and i was trying to talk to to my husband about about things and and uh It just didn't seem like he was too interested you know so i was on this pity party and i went to god and and uh was complaining you know and i I thought god was gonna just pat my little head and say well honey i know that and god was so gentle with me you know he always was but i heard him say really clearly he said mary he said do you remember when you first married mike and he wanted to talk about me and you told him that you didn't want to talk about that do you remember when you would get up in the morning before you went to work and he would put on praise and worship music and you told him you didn't want to hear it he said i want you to pray that i restore what you killed in him and i'll tell you folks took me a minute to get off the floor because i i remembered saying those things i hadn't thought about it for years but I, I thought, oh, my word, I did do that. Um, and so anyway, I, it's just like I got this, you know, panoramic vision of how I'd been used by the enemy to stifle things with him. So I was finally able to get up off the floor. <laughs> and, and he had been taking um, a bath because he was really feeling bad. He'd been sick. And so um, he was in the, the bathroom that was next to the bedroom where I was praying, and I... I started praying. I said, oh, God, please restore, restore anything that that I've been used to tear down in him. And so I heard him saying something. And so I just went knocked on the door and I peeked in. I said, you okay? And he said, I've not had the anointing on me like this in years. And I just fell to the floor and I asked him to forgive me because I could see all that I'd done. Uh, I think I'd been a dream crusher, you know, anything that, that he God would give him to do. I think I think I was just so concerned that these people were uh, going to destroy us. I think that there would be this, you know, this uh, pressure to just try to try to get us to have like a life where we were just, you know, I wanted him to have a regular job and because I felt like that was security. But our security was in in him doing what God told him to do. I had no clue about that. I could see it, but it was, I just saw what Satan had used me for. And so that was a huge, huge breaking of, or, or smack in the face of that antichrist spirit. And so I can look back and see how God allowed people to come to the ministry for me to pray for. Um, you know, I'd have such attacks when I was praying for the, these other victims and, and I'd have, 
I would have headaches and nosebleeds, and I just felt like I got punched in the gut. I'd get up the next morning and go again. I just, I was so stubborn. I thought, you know, Satan, you've got to, you're not more powerful than God. And I was just determined I was going to keep going. And I think because God brought the people for me to pray for them, there was an anointing there that as I was praying for them, it was healing me and, and just tearing the dickens out of any kind of antichrist system built within my mind. And so... I wanted you to see how God was just step by step taking me through. And you might be in a place right now and you just think, boy, I don't understand where I'm at. You know, I I don't feel like I'm making some breakthroughs. Um, But you might be right where you need to be at this specific moment in a healing journey. Because a lot of those times when I was in those places, it didn't feel so good. Um, You know, I had some somebody tell me you know well I I don't know if if this is healing when you feel yucky and you feel dirty well God can have you in a in a healing situation but as memories come up and things God's trying to bring things to the surface it doesn't feel warm and fuzzy it usually feels yucky (laughs) Um, but it's there's an end to it and that's what I tell everyone so so I'm praying that this will will give you some answers some insight to where you will see what God's doing because I promise you this. He loves you beyond anything you could imagine, more than that. And he is wanting you to be free. It was never his will for you to be harmed. And he wants you free. He wants you healed. And that's that's the path he's got us on. And I'm believing we're going to see more and more of that each day. And as we go through these next podcasts, we're going to take some specific things and I'll, I'll have some uh, prayers that I put on the on our ad copy for each podcast and for the one today i will put uh, i will put that link to jack hayford's teaching on um pleading the blood and so thank you so much for listening to this and i will talk to you on the next podcast